Okay, so are, is everybody here? Are we missing? Who are we missing? Edward and Molina. Two, four, six, yeah, just everyone. Okay. So uh, before we get started uh, with the gerontology lecture, we just, um, we know that some of you have already started to meet with uh, community uh, contacts, right? Or, you know, talk about your project, talk about potential clinical sites. Some of you have actually gone out there and helped at the uh, vaccine drives as, as the college has and the rest of the nursing programs have. So um, by all means, those will count as clinical hours. You know, so when that opportunity arises for you to work at a, at a, at a health fair or to immunize, you know, make sure that you track all the hours that you are actually doing when you're on site. Now, I'm pretty sure we had um, presented the, the log, but I'm gonna go ahead and share that with you all again. I went ahead and uploaded it to the uh, 33, 13 course. And so it says clinical documentation. Please review these documents for clinical. Really quickly, let me just show you the community person's contacted form. Now this is for any interaction that you've had with any patients in the community, whether it's a physician, whether it's another nurse, whether it's a patient that had, that fit your community of interest. Like maybe you um, just, for example, work at a school and you talk to, for example, UJL, you know, a parent that had a concern about obesity in their child, that's a community contact. And maybe you ask them, you know, uh, would something like this interest you? Would you a program tailored to teaching your family or your child about diet and nutrition and you know, the parents said, you know what, I think that would be really interesting. And so you have a conversation with this mother, right? That's a community contact. So we want you to give us the day, the name of the person. If they have a title, you can put a parent. If it was a parent, maybe it was a parent of a patient you cared for in the emergency room, right? Maybe the child came in with um, hyperglycemia and uh, he was a diabetic, you know? And so if it's a conversation that you have with anybody, whether it's a physician, another nurse, whether it's a dietitian, somebody in the community that, that of course it pertains to your community of interest and your project, we want you to keep track of them, okay? Anybody that you come across with. These are people that you could potentially, you know, conduct clinicals with over the summer, these are people that you could potentially interview, right, over the summer. Because again, we don't know with the pandemic whether we're gonna be completely on, on be able to do on-site clinicals or they're gonna move us back to face-to-face. -to -face. Cause that was the issue last summer that there was no on-site clinicals. Everything was face-to-face -to -face, or our students had to get creative with uh, accruing their clinical hours. And some of them were done through interviews. So you interview a parent through Zoom, you interview a doctor through Zoom, you interview a dietitian through Zoom. And you keep track, you spend an hour talking to that dietitian and you're doing an interview with them, um, then that will count towards your clinical hours. So just keep track of all the people you come in contact with. Because again, these could be potential interviews for you or potential places you could do clinicals. I know Tracy has already called a few sites already um, about you know, the services that they offer for our community based on her population, which is um, you know, adolescence and, and, and depression. And so those are the people that she would want to document here, right? The day, who they contacted. If they're, if they're a parent, you can put parent. If they're a client, you can put client. If it's a doctor or a nurse, whatever, how we could contact them, the topics that you discussed, and then the total number of hours you, you spoke to them. Okay, so try to keep it at, at a 0.5 or one hour or 1.5 hours or two hours. So try to just, you know, uh, keep it at a point. Yeah. So, so this we want you guys to get creative as to where you're going to get information from and whatnot. Uh, don't get creative with the math, but get creative with where you're going to get information. And that way it's not redundant. Now, if you were able to talk to a, let's say, JL for a community representative, maybe someone that's a liaison with schools or things of that sort, that is part of a, <clears throat> I don't know, a, a parent teachers association and she's the liaison for the community or things of that sort, that would be quite feasible. A parent would be great. One parent with maybe a, a child with special needs dietary needs, uh, a child with uh, type one diabetes would be great to kind of discuss the, the options, but um, anything that would be more generalized or marry more, uh, I don't want to say generic, but that didn't offer as much insight probably would limit it to one parent that really didn't have a lot of 
needs for their child or, you know, things of that sort, JL. So we, want you, we wouldn't want you to interview 300 parents with no special needs for their kids. Uh, maybe one parent in general with a, a teenager that says, well, he sometimes he eats, maybe he doesn't eat, et cetera. So keep those things open, but, you know, try to keep your hours rounded off to things that are, you're going to gather a good amount of information. As Ms. Jimenez went over the different types of sources for information from last semester, there is a place for you to add these people with communications and their titles or their expert opinions or things of this sort. So it's not that it's not usable. Um, so that's what we mean by being creative. Mm -hmm. Like for Maria Quash, maybe a lactation consultant. If you talk with a lactation consultant, then that's somebody that would go on this list, right? So it doesn't have to be a nurse. It just has to be somebody who has direct knowledge or cares for one of the clients, you know, that you, that, that fits your community of interest. Um, the other form I was going to show you all is the uh, clinical log. This is where we track how many hours you are accruing, okay? And we, some of you have already started accruing hours now, okay? So the date, the type of activity, if it was a vaccine drive, you can put vaccine drive. And I think that's where most of you are at now. If it was the nurse talks with the Texas Nurses Association, you can put those here. Those already count. You're already accruing hours based on that, right? If you attended the nurse talks. Now, so, remember you had to have registered for the nurse talks and gotten the certificate so that we can document your attendance, okay? So remember that uh, part of the process is you enroll, you don't necessarily have to be a member. I think Mo, they don't have to be members of the ANA or the TNA, right? They can enroll randomly for the nurse talks, yes? Yes, that's correct. So if you guys got those certificates, add them on there. Uh, if you send us a write-up for the nurse talks, then you add another hour. So that would be two, one for attendance and one for the write-up for the nurse talks. And then you're, you're cruising along. Uh, but keep in mind, I know that the, we want to help out with the vaccination drive. Uh, but as I think at some point, Mr. Molina mentioned the vaccine drive this week at the uh, South Laredo uh, Family Clinic. And so I went to go see it. And it's probably not as productive as we were hoping for it to be. It wasn't the same if some of you guys got to see the, the Tammy U uh, vaccine drive that they had. I know they had one at the LEA today. Uh, and those are extensive. They need a lot of leadership. They need a lot of nurses. They need a lot of help. And those would be something that I think would be more beneficial to us as BSNs and experienced nurses. Rather than the one at the, at the clinic, it was a little stagnant. Um, They're a little disorganized. Their leadership wasn't necessarily where we would want it to be. Uh, so, you know, I would stay away from activities of that sort. It's not just a matter of accumulating hours, but, you know, we want to make sure that we're able to communicate with other people, other disciplines that are having a structured uh, process. Um, you know, we don't want to be the ones that are the most uh, licensed on the lot. And that, that may create a problem for us, right? If we show up, we're students and we are the people with the highest license and the most, uh, I guess, healthcare experience and it sets up a, a kind of a cautious uh, moment for us so the one for the this week for those of you that were planning on attending and have not i would kind of defray for another time i know that mr soto mr reyes soto uh who's coordinating the vaccination of the um elderly communities is going to have a drive on saturday he was going to send me the hours and the time i think it's going to be at uh was it 800 Juarez or 715 salinas or 800 one, maybe one of those but those two homes downtown um, he was going to have a drive there. And so we were able, we were going to be able to get some hours there, but I'll, I'll give you the specifics once he sends me those today, if not tomorrow for Saturday, uh, for those of you that are available. Uh, remember, these are voluntary at this point. If you cannot attend these functions, that's okay. Because technically we shouldn't be accumulating hours until we get into the May, uh, June, July courses. Now you may be pressed a little bit for time, but last year that's what we did. And they were able, as long as they planned their time accordingly, they were able to finish with plenty of time. So don't feel like you're, you know, you're gonna run out of time at this point if you're not attending these drives. I know some of you guys are working and you have other things demands. So that's okay. Um, but you know, there will be a process by which you can finish in uh, May. So, you know, if you can attend, don't feel like it's a do or die. Um, there will be a lot of opportunities for us to participate. Yeah, but again, by that saying, you know, if you have a, Saturday off and you want to get in some hours, these are available to you all. And we try to, whenever we, we like Mr. Santos said, we know whenever we get information about a vaccine drive or one of the students brings it to us, we want to share it with everybody so that, you know, everybody's available to do that. If it, if you're, like I said, if your schedule allows, okay. Now at the end, when you all are ready to graduate, 
this checklist should uh, add up to 96 hours. So not this checklist, this clinical log, I'm sorry, should add, add up to 96 hours, okay? So we want you all to keep track of your hours on this log so that at the end, we just total them here. So please keep only one log and just add to it as you start to do more and more activities, okay? Um, hold on just a second. I don't know what Yes, Joe. Um, <clears throat> back to the 15 minute uh, question thing. Um, so, if, because uh, we also do testing at, at STAT, right? You know, sometimes we'll test 35, you know, 40 patients. So, we, you know, we, we spend 15 minutes with each patient, but if you times that times 40, so that's would be more than 15. I mean, how would I handle that? I mean, is it 15 minutes per patient or 15 minutes? In total, I mean, that would be like several hours. Right, it would be 600 hours. Um, so, <laughs> 600 hours. Yeah. You may be in the same situation that Mo's in. Uh, but, so. I mean, that would just, I mean, even though it's 15 minutes with each patient, but it's 35 to 40 patients. So, right. I guess that would disqualify me for, okay. For face to face at this point, at this point, it would. But uh -huh. again, you know, there's no need to panic. Uh, you're doing the nurse talks. Okay. You're doing the up with, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and, and honestly, you, we're only allowing these things because they come up. Honestly, if it wasn't for COVID or, or even last year, even with the students last year, we did not allow them to start besides the nurse talks before May, and they were able to finish without an issue. And of course, okay. there's some people that put everything off to the last week. Uh, but the people that started were organized and got these things done. And there's a lot of COVID stuff, even some of the stuff that we used last year um, for pandemics and whatnot from the World Health Organization, we can use. Some of them are free. If you want to pay for some, we're not encouraging you to pay for them, uh, but they're free and you can get hours from that. And they're just modules that you do just like the ATIs, but they're based on either pandemics, care, uh, per personal protective equipment, you know, uh, disease tracking for the World Health Organization, a bunch of different things that are very, very eye-opening and they're non-traditional in regards to nursing. They're more epidemiological than they are nursing related. So it shows you how they track disease, how they found the, the first cases in Seattle, how they came from China, how they got to Europe. And so it covers a lot of that that's very interesting. And although not directly related to your project, it does allow you to accumulate some of those hours. So those things that are general and applicable to our current health crisis we will allow you to use. And it won't be just, I mean, I know, I know, and we haven't come up with topics, but that's why you have to clear the topics with us uh, before you actually select something and move on to that uh, webinar. So you would send it to us with the objectives and see what you're going to be studying. And then we tell you yes or no, or how much time that was uh, uh, going to accumulate. Now I do, I do want Ms. Uh, Ms. Jimenez to show you, did you show them the part that has to be notarized, Marisa? Anyone? I can't hear anybody. Did I lose you all? Sorry, I was muted. I'll go back to that right now. What I did want to show them was this webinar criteria form, especially like, well, for everybody who's planning to use uh, or can, wants us to consider a webinar as a clinical hour or clinical uh, hours. This webinar criteria form, we had created it last uh, year. And I will upload, this is just a sample, but I'll upload this so that you all can see what we're referring to. We were approving the webinars before the students started taking them, right? They weren't just taking whatever webinars. Um, and so we would ask them to submit the title of the webinar, uh, who is the organizer, for example, if it's the nurse talks, right? And then the organization would be the Texas Nurse Association. The official registration or enrollment, because we do want you to officially register for TN, or the Texas, the nurse talks, right? I mean, I know TNA, you have to be a membership, but you can register for the nurse talks. You can register for a lot of these webinars so that they give you a certificate when you've completed it. And we use that as documentation that you did complete the webinar. So we do want you to officially register and enroll in the course. Now, if you have to pay for the course, that's on, on you all. I know some of the students were getting like, I don't know, 10 hours or 12 hours, but they had to pay for the, was a course that they had to pay for. And that was, I mean, we didn't make them pay for anything, but if they wanted to, that was up to them. And that was of course, official enrollment. They took tests and all that stuff. Um, so we did count those as clinical hours because they did get you know certificates for that as well. But of course, those they had to pay for them. Um, 
it says, uh, we do ask that you evaluate that, um, that webinar and compare it to the student learning outcomes and determine how does this webinar, how does this information that I'm getting fit my student learning outcomes? Which of the seven student learning outcomes that are on your syllabi basically meet the, the objectives or these objectives, I'm sorry, meet, meet those student learning outcomes of the a webinar criteria. So for example, for this student, this was an example, this was being offered by the John Hopkins Institute. It was fighting COVID-19 with epidemiology, a John Hopkins teacher. He officially registered on this day and it met uh, the learning outcomes one, two, and seven, where we have seven student learning outcomes. So he determined that it did meet those. And then he gave us uh, the date, the information was sent to us. And then he gave us a link to the webinar. So Mr. Santos and I would go in and we check it out, make sure it is legit, make sure it is being offered by a credible institution that you all do have to register for it. And then we would approve it. And, uh, and so once you get our approval, then you can add this to your clinical log, okay? So this here is an example and I will uh, post it for you all. You can use this form when you send it to Mr. Santos and I for um, consideration. And again, you can just keep adding to them. Okay, you can just keep adding as you come up with a new one, add, add and add. Um, that way we keep all condensed in one page. If you're submitting lots of pages, you know, it gets a little bit um, confusing for us. So I will upload this so that you all can start using this. Let's say you come across a webinar, share it with the group, you know, ask Mr. Santos, Ms. Jimenez, um, can, will you approve this for clinical hours? And then we'll review it if it's really good. And it may not fit for everybody. If let's say Maria comes across one that has to do with uh, breastfeeding and uh, you know postpartum uh, depression and things like that, it may not be applicable you know, to Jail or to David, right? And so then it will only be applicable for Maria. So they may not all fit everybody's needs. But if it's something a little more general, if it has to do with the COVID, um, with a pandemic, anything with a pandemic, that's general. So we can all, that would apply for everybody. Does that make sense? It, it, it does get a little tedious when you're not, because now we have to do all this other stuff to try to get creative with coming up with hours. Um, and like I said, right now as it stands, they will allow you to do on-site clinicals, um, but you know, who knows where we'll be, you know, in a month, a month from now, right? Oh, the form that Mr. Santos was saying um, that has to be notarized. It was, I believe this is, Maybe not that way. <laughs> Is it, it's towards the back. Um, it starts after this one. Oh, next one. Oh, yeah, there. It's a waiver. Oops. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. But it's a waiver. It starts here. Basically, it's a waiver of liability you know, that you are aware that there is I mean, some risk, right? Uh, which you all are probably more exposed than, than the, like our, our regular students than our ABM students. But uh, it's basically a waiver that you do have to sign that you are aware of the risks. You, of have to get you don't just have to sign it. Say it again? They have to get it notarized, not just right. signed. Correct. And um, Ms. Parra is a notary, the, the secretary for the VN. And so she has agreed to notarize these for you all. Uh, no charge, is that right? Right, there's a fee. Sometimes a, a, no, a notary's charge uh, to stamp it and make it legal. And she will um, do that, notarize for you guys. But of course you have to be there physically, you have to bring your license, et cetera. If you guys are interested, it may be more inconvenient for you guys to go all the way to the South Campus and get it notarized. Uh, but um, if, if you can do it on your own, you can go to your own notary. Uh, my Ms. Jimenez wants to give you guys a, a timeline for that also. Probably by the time we meet with Dr. Miller would be very important. Um, so if you guys are interested, let me know what day, what time would be best. If you want to go to the South and we can schedule us every 10, 15 minutes to have her notarize all our paperwork and, and then we'll be all set. Um, it might be fun for you guys if you haven't seen the South Campus yet. Uh, yeah. It's not that fun, but you know, it might be fun. I don't know. We'd like to have all these forms and all your immunizations, right? I know some of you logged on kind of late, but uh, we would like to have all this information by February the 4th, which is the date that you're meeting with Dr. Miller. She'll visit her class, but um, 
we have posted them under announcements just so you can kind of go through them. Um, but we will do the PDF timestamp signature. Uh, we'll update those. Ms. Ms. Bettis, our secretary, the BSN secretary, is working right. on that. What are the announcements? It's a 3D 13 course uh, for those of you who want to know how to get there. And they'll, they'll stay on there for the whole semester, the clinical documentation, and they're all on there. And they are on, and uh, Thomas made it a little harder, but if you go to the files section there, everything that's a document in the class is listed here in alphabetical order. So it may be a little bit more difficult like that, but they're under those announcements. These be physical forms. Well, you, you'll turn in the notarized copy, yes, Jail. Uh, do you want to, did you want to scan it? Is that what you're asking us? Yeah, since, uh, since we're doing like everything like scanned, I just want to make sure that, do these have to be actual forms? You know, well, that we give you the... Right, to get it notarized, yeah, you do need the actual form, but I guess we can take a scanned copy because we're going to scan them anyway into your files, right, Marisa? Yes, that's correct. So if you want oh. to scan them and not make the trip to the south, that's okay. We'll take a, a scanned version with three or four pages on there. Uh, we don't know how easy or convenient you guys have a, a printer with a scannable, uh, you know, uh, function on it. Uh, but if you want to scan them, you can send them to us, uh, scanned, signed, and, and notarized. Okay. And if it's not convenient to go to the south, uh, you can drop off some of this documentation at, at our clinic, our night clinic, drive by. Say this is for Mr. Santos or Ms. Jimenez. We'll collect those. That way you don't have to make a trip to the south. Uh, I know jail doesn't go past the 7.0045. So, you know, he doesn't leave that area. So I get you, jail. I get you. I'm going to add um, the clin the webinar criteria form here to this uh, message. So that way it's easy for you all to find everything. There we go. So they're all in one place under the announcements. I mean, make sure that you all set meetings with us. I know you've asked several times, you know, can we set up meetings with you all? I mean, by all means, you all know that, you know, um, whenever you all are ready, reach out to us and we can set up a meeting about all these little questions that you may have regarding the documentation, regarding your work, where you work, the type of exposure that you may have. Um, Although we should be meeting, honestly, for our literature search. We should have already set up an appointment, gone through our literature search, make sure we're on the right track. We're looking for those same things. I know Ms. Jimenez and I are both astonished to see who's going to win, who, who gets more student meetings. And so far, we're tied at zero, zero. So Nobody set up meetings with me. Or uh, so whenever you all are ready, make sure you don't want to wait too long. Um, I know we haven't had anything, made, no major assignments yet for the gerontology course. Um, the PowerPoint presentation today or the screen, the, under the announcements, it was just so we can have for discussion. So you all can have some points to, to discuss, but it, I mean, it was nothing to, to stress about. Um, I'm going to do a little short presentation on the gerontology and why we included this course in our curriculum. Because I'm sure you all know that let me make sure I am recording. Yeah, that um, Mr. Santos and I were, were tasked with developing this curriculum. And so we created it from the bottom up. Like we chose what courses we wanted to put in it, what we thought was important, what would separate you all from the associate degree nurse? Like what is a bachelor prepared nurse? How is that different than an associate degree nurse, right? And so we started choosing courses that were going to develop uh, your skills, specifically the, the four concepts that drive our program, which were your leadership skills, uh, caring for communities, our uh, research and how to work with research, and then of course, informatics and technology. And so, you know, looking at, at, at those, um, those concepts and, and when we were devising our curriculum, uh, we also have to look at what the standards for the Texas Board of Nursing are, because we have a lot of agencies that uh, guide and provide standards for nurses in the state of Texas. And so um, the Texas Board of Nursing is one of those. Uh, even though they don't accredit our BSN program, they acknowledge it and we had to present to them, you know, our curriculum and how, again, how it, how it differentiated from the ADM program. Uh, one of the things that they're big on is uh, community and care for our, our elder population. Why do you all think that is? Why do you think, I'm just, you know, knowing that you all are active providers and many of you care for elderly patients, 
why do you think that the drive, the focus for nurses is to, to care for, for patients in this age group? So the most vulnerable population? They're the most vulnerable, absolutely. Especially now with the pandemic, don't we know it? Aren't they the ones that we're trying to protect, right, the most? They're the ones that are at increased Correct. risk, right? For morbidity and mortality from this pandemic. Uh, what else? What else? Why do you think you know caring for older older patients is is important? Why nurses today's nurses have to be prepared to to care adequately for these patients? Because there's a uh, there's a lot more of us. <laughs> They're living long. <laughs> <Lot. laughs> <laughs> Say it again, Jail. Because there's more of us. Yeah. Well. We're starting to <laughs> right. People are living longer, don't we know that? People are living a lot longer with the advances in technology, more preventive services. People are living longer. They're living longer with chronic illnesses, right? Our baby boomers are, are, are you know, we're in the era of, of baby boomers and our baby boomers are intelligent, right? They, they know they have active participants in their care. And so, you know, we need to be able to meet the needs of our community. And so, um, we're, I'm going to show you just a quick intro on gerontology and why it's important. If I can figure out how to. Uh, I guess that'll work. Can you all see that okay? Yes? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. So, yeah, I mean, that's the reason why, and, and we as nurses have been prepared to care for this population. Um, it says, describe characteristics of today's older population in regard to life expectancy, right? We know that uh, patients are, are living longer because, like we said, the advances in technology um, with chronic illnesses, with comorbidities. And so we as nurses need to learn how to educate and explain that to them. Um, we're going to go over marital status, you know, for our older uh, population, living arrangements for our older population, Income and employment, right? Where does their income come from? Are they working? And as you can see with the baby boomers, they're still working. They're still working. They're, they're, they don't want to retire and they don't want to retire because it's a sense of uh, independence. It's a sense of um, capability. If they retire to them, it may seem like I'm, in, I'm incapable of, you know, of working. Uh, it, it seems as a, as a detriment if they have to stop working. And so they continue to work. Right? We have a lot of nurses that fit this description, the baby boomer nurses, the older nurses that come with a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, right? And uh, they're an asset to our profession, right? And, these, and this community, this population is an asset um, to us and we can learn from them, right? So we're talking a little bit about the health status, you know, what they are, what kind of chronic problems they encounter, what they're more likely to die of, right, when they do pass. Uh, we're also going to discuss the projected changes in the future generations of older people and the implications of healthcare. So what do we as, as nurses have to be aware of? And so the subsets of the older adult population, uh, we kind of looked at that, it, you know, before it was just old, the word old, and now it's kind of been divided into young old, right, middle old, old old, and then centennials are the people that live over 100 years. Now, within this age group, you know, you all know that we should not stereotype, right, our elders. I mean, I can tell you that my mom started using Facebook, right, and text messaging and shorthand me before I was on Facebook. <laughs> so our geriatric population are, are quick, like I said, especially right now, the, they're active, they still exercise, they know all about technology, they're, they want to be, you know, an active participant in their healthcare. And so we can't just stereotype all individuals, all of our elder population is just old, right? And no, they, they, they can't, they don't do well with technology. And uh, no, we still have to give them paper everything. And, you know, for some of these people, they're pretty independent and they want to be able to, they want to be, like I said, active participants in their care. And y'all have seen that, I'm sure, right? And caring for your patients. So population growth and increasing life expectancy. It says persons 65 of years and older currently represent more than 13% of the US population. So that's a large percentage of our population that are you know, at increased risk for COVID right now during the pandemic. These are the ones that we are protecting when we tell our patients, our younger patients, you know, don't visit your grandparents. 
You know, you want to make sure that you social distance. You want to make sure, you know, um, that they get the COVID vaccine. You know, why do you think they were the first ones in line to get their COVID vaccine, right? Um, because they're the highest risk. It says by 2030, by the year 2030, the older adult population will grow to 20% of the population. That's one fifth of our population will consist of, patient, of individuals, I'm sorry, 65 years and older. And so that's more people dealing with chronic illness, dealing with comorbidities that we as nurses have to teach them to learn to manage, right? So, I mean, this population is only going to grow from here. Life expectancy has increased over the years. Again, like we said, with the advances in technology, with us pushing preventive health care. So in 1930, the life expectancy was 59.7. Right now, the life expectancy has increased to 78.2 years. So we can only hope that we get to live that long, right? At least that long. Um, but with that comes the quality of life, right? We want them to be independent. We want them to have a good quality of life up to those years, right? It says population over 85 years uh, will double by the year 2036 and triple by the year 2049. So people are living well, well up to 85 years of age now, right? And people living over 100 years of age are increasing. So factors influencing increased life expectancy, advances in disease control and technology, lower infant and child mortality rates, improved sanitation, so improved running water, uh, improved plumbing, uh, improved city ordinances. That is what's helping you know, increase the life expectancy in our geriatric population uh, and better, better living conditions for them. It says um, life expectancy for race and gender. It says gap widening between white people and black people. It says nurses should be concerned with health and societal issues. So yes, Black people still have the, the shortest life expectancy, and it has to do with chronic conditions, diabetes, mellitus, heart disease, obesity. Um, those are the things that tend to decrease their life expectancy. Um, but, and they say that this gap is widening. Um, it's also narrowing between males and females, where uh, before females would live longer, um, men are kind of catching up. And again, it has to do with the advances of technology, right? and education. Marital status and living arrangements says half of women over 65 are widowed. The majority of men over 65 are remarried. So this is basically that men over 65 tend to remarry where women over 65 will, will stay alone. They'll live alone, they'll live at home, right? Or we're not surprised. <laughs> can, men can't be alone. <laughs> Some men are more likely to remarry is what it says. It says most older adults live with spouse or other family members, but many of them still live alone, right? How many of you all have parents that live alone or would rather live alone, right? Well, I know I do. They, they definitely would rather have their independence. They like their privacy, right? It says twice the number of women than men live alone later in life. And the potential for living alone increases with age, both for men and women. So of course, the longer they live, um, they live, a partner will die, and they're more likely to live alone. Uh, if not, again, move in with their adult children. The percentage of older adults living below the poverty level has declined. It says most depend on social security for more than half of their income. And so, that, so this is still, um, you know, very important to them that there's enough social security to, to maintain their, their home, to maintain their life. So there's a high prevalence of home ownership by older adults. So older adults are considered asset rich and cash poor, meaning their houses are paid. You know, they have equity, they have a home that's already been paid for, but many of them, if they don't work, you know, it's hard for them to maintain their lifestyle. It's hard for them to pay their taxes. It's hard, it's hard for them to pay their utilities and their bills, right? And that's where social security is, is important to kind of fill in that need for them. It says women in minority groups have less income than white men, and that's just in general. It says employment and the older adult population, the percentage of older workers in the labor force is declining. So uh, although we know that our baby boomers are still working, it says that in the labor force, it's still, there's still a decline in older adults in the labor force. Men leaving workforce at an early age, um, that is actually increasing. The number of middle-aged women employed is increasing. And then the baby boomers desire to continue to work at the age of 
retirement is increasing. And we can see that. We can see that with, you know, nurses. We can see that with, um, in the different places that we work, you know, older people still want to be independent. They still want to work. They still want to be useful, right? It's their sense of, of importance. The trend toward uh, education has increased for older adults. We see a lot of that in our students, even in the ADN program, right, Mr. Santos? A lot of older individuals coming back to get an associate's degree in nursing. Right? Not these guys, these guys are all young. <laughs> but I mean, I would say probably the last five, 10 years, I mean, we had a few older individuals, you know, had, had gone to two or three careers in their lifetime and they wanted to be nurses. Um, they wanted to make a contribution to their community and they weren't ready to just retire, right? So it says advanced degrees are more prevalent than in the past uh, and have higher incomes. Older adults will be more informed of healthcare consumers. And that's what we said, that they're knowledgeable. You know, they, they look for information. They want to know about their health. They want to know how can I control my health? You know, um, I mean, I feel like we still, our culture, you know, cult, you know cultural diversity, our, our culture still plays a huge part into what we see in our geriatric population. You know, many of them still hold the belief that the doctor is right. And many of them still don't know, you know, what their medications are for, what, how to manage their illness. And, you know, I, I think culture may play a part into it. And that's something that we definitely have to consider with, with our geriatric population. You know, what are the cultural implications of their health? You know, how has it impacted? And we as nurses have to turn that around. You know, tell them it's important for you to care for your health. It's important for you to know this. It's important for you to know why you're taking this medication. Right. So, as chronic illnesses are major problems. Uh, most older, older adults have at least one chronic illness. So, the longer they live, the longer, the more likely they're going to live with chronic illness, like we said, and comorbidities. Chronic conditions limit activities of daily living and independent ADLs. They're a major source of disability. So chronic conditions, heart disease, arrhythmias, um, uh, 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 coronary artery disease, diabetes, neuropathies, these are all the things that we know affect our older population. Leading chronic conditions include arthritis, hypertension, hearing issues, heart conditions, visual impairments, orthopedic issues, uh, diabetes, sinusitis, allergies, and varicose veins. Um, as far as Medicare, um, we know uh, it's, primary uh, health insurance program for our uh, patients over 65 years of age. Uh, part A, uh, very limited. We know that um, we've seen that in our patients. You know, it'll cover hospital and maybe physician visits. Um, and then they have to purchase, you know, part B, part C, part D in order for them to get a, a greater extensive, more coverage. And they have to pay extra. And some of them don't have the money to pay extra, right? It's like paying an extra insurance. Some of them don't have the money to pay that extra insurance where Part B will uh, cover their medical visits, um, their medications, their like referrals to physical therapy, their durable medical equipment. Um, and so that's where Part B comes in. Uh, Part C has other advantages. Um, I believe it's like vision, uh, other, you know, other things that are probably not considered as uh, urgent or crucial in their care. I mean, we know it all is, but you know, they, they start to think, okay, what's the most important? The most important is when they're in the hospital. Okay, and then what, you know, what could be covered by other, um, other plans, right? And then the Part D would be a drug plan, which is like a prescription program for them. Uh, but we see that a lot, even in our clinic, uh, where, you know, Medicare only covers a certain amount. And so when we try to prescribe something for that, they have to pay out of pocket for it because Medicare won't cover it because it only covers certain medications. And so that's where we have to look as, as prescribers, we have to look at, okay, what's generic? what is in uh, the HEB rewards prescription program that will cost them more than $5, right? And for some of uh, our, our patients, that $5 is a lot of money, $10 is a lot of money, right? Um, Mr. Santos, is there anything you wanna to add to this in your experience in, in caring for this population and Medicare? Um, you know, we say that we wanna provide the best, uh, take care of our elderly and our young, uh, but I think the healthcare system now at this point um, may be doing a little bit more of a disservice. It's very difficult uh, to provide services for documentation for the elderly, uh, for veterans, uh, for the people that are entering their seventh decade of life and whatnot. Their care is complicated. So, you know, trying to seek out the most convenient and beneficial services for them is difficult for them. So we have to consider those things whenever we are providing care or planning care. Uh, for this, uh, these individuals. Okay. 
Um, so implications of an aging population is this approximately one in four older adults will spend some time in a nursing home. Uh, there's increased need for gerontological nurses. So this population, um, there's a lot of need. There's a lot of um, specific uh, education, specific care, specific training that our nurses need to care for this population. So, you know, that's where gerontological nursing comes in, right? Because you can specialize in this. And I, how many of you, do any of you have any specialty in this, in these areas? Training, any specialized training with gerontology? Mary? I don't have a certification. I've been wanting to do it, but I haven't done it. But I mean, that's my experience, geriatrics. Yeah. And it's because there is a unique need and they're, they're, they want to kind of formalize, um, I guess, the education that they give nurses to, to care for these patients. Um, and this, like we said, this population is only growing and this need for gerontological nurses is only going to grow. So I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good, um, it's something good to have. Um, and it's great that you considered it, Mary. Um, so increasing need for nurses, it says health and social agencies must anticipate future needs that we're gonna have more patients in nursing homes, that we're gonna have older patients with chronic illnesses, right? We as nurses need to be prepared for that. It says government payment of services in jeopardy in age of budget cuts. And that's what we have to keep in mind that, you know, we know that there's budget cuts, but the standard of care should not decrease. The care that we're providing for these patients should not be diminished or minimized uh, because of, you know, these budget cuts, right? Or, or the care should be standardized and, and, and up to par. It says baby boomers are the next wave of older adults. So the baby boomer is an individual born between 1946 and 1964. So I think what that's 75 to like 50, 56 to 75, something like that, 56 years old to 75, is that right? Uh, it says January 1st, 2011, beginning of baby boomers turning 65. That was when the baby boomer generation started. Uh, it is a diverse group. Uh, it says they're better educated. So um, a lot of them have ed college educations. They're enamored with high tech products. Like I said, our mom was, my mom was texting and Facebook and, you know, short messaging before I was. <laughs> Probably before, I don't know, Mr. Something before I was, that's for sure. Um, sometimes I have to ask her, what does that mean? Like, what are you trying to say? Cause she like shorthand her text messages and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so she was teaching me things um, and, you know, posting on Facebook, that's, she's, she's, she's pretty good at that. Um, so they are very fitness conscious. That's something important to know that they stay, still stay pretty active. They try to eat well, they, you know, it's important to exercise. Um, they're informed consumers and they will demand changes in long-term care. They will demand uh, adequate changes. They'll demand, you know, knowledge. They'll demand that they're getting uh, uh, quality care. And so that's important to know so that we can meet their demands. Uh, provision and payment of services. There's higher rates of hospitalization. This is with older populations living with chronic illness, higher rates of surgery and physician visits, uh, paid by federal dollars, most often things like Medicare and Medicaid. Right, Medicaid is if they get Medicaid, they're also living in poverty. Uh, it says less than 5% of older adults live in a nursing home, assisted living or other institutions. It says the role of the gerontological nurse is to be an advocate in ensuring that cost containment efforts do not jeopardize the welfare of older adults. So I think this PowerPoint or this chapter was a good introduction to why it's important for us to, to um, consider this, you know, this population uh, and the care that we provide for them. Um, I know that we did have an assignment last week. Uh, we talked about some of the economic assistance programs for our geriatric population. And it, it was posted in your discussion board, but um, do we have some time, Mr. Santos, anybody for them to present? Would anybody like to present theirs? Just kind of tell us a little bit about right. the project. If anybody would like to just summarize their, I guess, the economic findings. And you know what? Since it's not my field, and I always kind of feel like anything that's not my field, I'm always kind of interested just to see what's new or whatnot. I don't feel like anything's not interesting. And I know some of these assignments are out of your expertise. But like one thing that I, that I did, and I was astonished, and I can tell you about it right now, that I was astonished because it never dawned on me. And it took one of last year's students to tell me or to announce it in class when he was doing a presentation on, on geriatrics, Mr. Ramirez, 
<clears throat> whose population also has been in the community geriatric care, he said, well, you have to remember about uh, the elderly in, in nursing homes and, and residents and long-term residents is that they're not ill. This is where they live. So they may have some medical needs, but they live there. So they're not going to get better and go anywhere else. This is their home. And it dawned on me in one sudden flash, like maybe being ignorant, uh, which is the most fitting word that I felt like, well, oh, that's, that's true. They're not ill. They're not at the hospital. They're not being cared for right now until they're better than they go off to their, you know, uh, homes and whatnot. They live in these residences. So I always found that very, very, all right. Last year, I found it very, very enlightening because I hadn't thought about it in that fashion. We are going into their homes. We go with students. We go in there as nurses. We're trying to do all these things for them. And imagine you being in your house in your living room, trying to watch TV and sitting around in your boxers and they come in. No, no, you have to come socialize. No, no, you have to eat at this time. Yeah, I'd be upset. I would be upset. I, 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 if it's my home, I should have the rights that I have in my home um, and sit around in my boxers and watch TV. Uh, so I found that very enlightening. Was anyone able to find something that, I have significant for that kind of assistance uh, because I really don't know how much support is in there. I don't, I, I, the people that Ms. Jimenez says that come to our clinic are usually a little bit more impoverished. Uh, they probably need a little bit more uh, guidance and, and more of the basic care that, that we can give them. They don't need all this lab work and all these MRIs and all these EKGs. They're just sick. They have an earache. They don't feel good. They can't afford all that workup at some of these other places would say, you're here, you're this age, you're going to get, a 10 panel and you're going to get EKGs and all these other things. And they're like, well, I, I can't afford all that. I just, I'm here for an earache. Um, you know, is there anything that anyone found that they may, may want to share, Tracy? Maybe I don't mind uh, presenting first. Yeah. Yeah. I already prepared my, what um, topic that I discussed on. And, and I think it, it kind of, the reason why I want to go first, it maybe kind of, can go along with like what you said, Mr. Ramirez was talking about. So I guess I can share my screen, right? Yes, you should be able to. Right uh, here. You know, we learned, like Mr. Santo says, this is not our specialty. Like for some of you that have worked in, in long-term care, you know, your entire nursing profession or in your career, you know, so we learn a lot from you all too, when you all present these things, when you find these uh, articles when you find these programs, these economic assistance programs for our elderly population, like you all teach us things. And that's why I wanted you all to talk about it just so we can have a little dialogue as to what you found. Did you find something interesting? Was it a program that you found that you were unaware of that existed out there, right? And that's kind of what we want to share with the group. Okay, let's see if I can get it to, can you see it there? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, I tried uh, for my presentation or for my little research that I did was, I was trying to look into something different, something non-traditional, what we kind of think, um, what type of programs are out there that help the community. So, and our elderly population. So I, I've always heard about reverse mortgages um, and, and I never liked them. I always thought they were something bad that it was designed to take away an elderly person's home. And then when they pass away, the bank gets the house. And that may not exactly be the case. And it always, it, you know, it does differ based on the type of plan the senior chooses and um, I guess how much of the loan they borrow. So this is designed for seniors over the age of 62. The, the qualification is they have to have a home. And so the benefit of getting the reverse mortgage is that the home equity that they have, they can convert to cash to use for the remainder of their life. Um, there are qualifications, uh, again, the age, the homeowner, they do have to go with a mortgage uh, counselor and they have to uh, investigate why they want to get the loan. Do they uh, meet all of the other qualifications? I'm sure they look into credit report. Uh, have they, you know, maybe filed bankruptcy before? And they have to go in and discuss the alternatives to a reverse mortgage. So I always thought like it's a trick. They're gonna get they're gonna get this senior into this contract, and the senior is not gonna understand the full consequences of what they they've signed. And when they become ill, you know, it's gonna hurt the family dynamics because if they had children, the children are gonna be, you know, a lot of people say that children feel like their home was taken away from their parents, and and in this case because of the counseling they have to go through, I do feel that if the senior is of sound mind, of course they have to be to sign a contract, I do feel like they actually do know what they're getting themselves into and it's a choice they get to make. Um, 
the choice is going to be what's best for them um, so they can live out their life. Um, it's funded by different, there's three different ways that reversed mortgages can be funded. I mean, there's a single purpose reversed mortgage. And this one, sometimes certain states or local governments will offer this fund, um, this funding up and even some nonprofit organizations, which nonprofits awesome because they're not in it to make money, unlike the private sector. So of, of course, there's going to be that private sector that wants to make money. So they can also invest in the same type of business. So uh, er, not everyone who gets a reversed mortgage is getting it from the same place. So there could be potentially some reversed mortgages that actually are a little bit better than other ones um, because of the intent of why, you know, why they're agreeing to lend out the money. And then there are some that are federally insured. Um, it's gonna be the home equity conversion mortgages. And these are backed by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So you've heard of HUD before. They do back these uh, particular ones. So three types. Um, you know, I guess it's good to know. So if you ever suggest a reverse mortgage, you can let the, the senior know that there are options. And, you know, how does it benefit them? So it all depends why they want the loan. Then they have to choose what type of loan is best for them. Different loans can um, indicate how they spend the money. There are some that it doesn't, they don't care. You borrow the money, the, the patient, I mean, the person can spend it however they see fit. There are some that maybe only can be used for medical expenses. Some can be just for home repair. So let's say the home they live in is, is, you know, needing a lot of repairs and maybe not safe to live in. And their option is to leave their home to go into a nursing home because they can't afford the home repairs, they can actually get a reversed mortgage to help repair the home and they get to stay living there. So it, it kind of, it's like a win-win. Would you rather live in a nursing home or, you know, fix up your home? And if the home wasn't that bad of a shape, you know, that they would want to leave and go to a nursing home, it, you know, probably isn't going to be something desirable that maybe somebody would want to inherit anyway. So the way that would work is depending how long their loan is, depending how long they live, would eat up some of the equity in that home, but they got to live in a comfortable environment. So they can even spend it on leisure activities. If they borrow um, the type of loan where they can use it however they want, they can go vacation in Europe if they want to. If that's how they want to live out their, their golden years. Of course, the, the home is going to lose its equity. So if, you know, when the pay, people pass away who have a home, reversed home mortgage, um, the children, if there's any involved, may not be left with much, you know, at the end or um, less value for that home. So the home, they might have to buy out the, the remaining part that they lent if the, if the kids want to keep the home. So it could affect the health care in the future because, you know, these elderly people, like we were saying, they may not have enough money to buy their medication. If they get a reversed mortgage, they might that might be the extra money that they need to pay for their bills. Um, so they don't have to worry about living paycheck to paycheck with uh, social security or maybe a very small retirement or no retirement at all. And so it can lessen that stress of, of medical bills, even utility bills, whatever the case may be. The benefit of having uh, some of these have provisions that the borrower is still able to live in a nursing home, let's say they need actual uh, skilled nursing care that they can't get at their home, they can stay in the nursing home for up to 12 consecutive months before that loan must be repaid. So they can leave their home and go into the facility. After the 12 months though, the contract would be voided and then the loan would have to be repaid. So they would see how much, um, how much money would you have to pay up front to, to finalize that loan and to settle it out. So in that case, you know, if, if the person cannot pay for the loan, then if the children are able to pay, pay off that borrowed money, then they get to keep the house. You know, it, it's really just a loan on the house is all that it is. But, you know, I, I, I thought it had a bad rap until I looked into it a little bit more. And I started thinking about my own parents. Um, you know, they worked hard all of their lives and they, they have everything paid off. But should something happen that they need money to stay living in their home, I would be fine with them taking on a reverse mortgage. And, and then if for whatever reason, when they pass away, I don't get any of their belongings, that's fine with me because they worked hard for that. So it's kind of like they get to use 
some of the equity they worked so hard for um, their whole life uh, to be able to live, you know, comfortably the rest of theirs. So especially now that both of my parents are retired uh, recently and um, they are in a completely different budget than they are used to. It's night and day for them. So I would totally be fine with, with reverse mortgages for them, even though I, I thought they were terrible. But that's what I learned. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions on it. Let me go back. Any questions, any comments? Well, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's, they worked hard for it. This is their home. You want them to enjoy it. This is what we talk about their quality of life. If they're, and this is what we talk about, you know, asset rich, cash poor. If they have a home, but they can't enjoy it. They can't enjoy their life. They can't enjoy their golden years. You know, this, and it's their home. It's, this is, you know, I think it's ideal for somebody like that. If they know what they're getting into. Yeah. What about when you're uh, cash poor and asset poor? That's <laughs> What do I do then? Plasma. So my plasma. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, I, and I'm glad. I mean, and we, nobody's traveled here. None of you guys have traveled. JL, David. So, I mean, we know we see the riches somewhere else to get into these other fields. And, and you know, right now while we're young, we have options. As, as Tracy said, as we get older and you're putting work to see certain things to have these futures plan out, the landscape of the country has changed, where money is has changed, healthcare has changed. So those things don't always come to pass. And so, you know, having some other viable avenues by which you can finance your life. Because remember, we have to consider that these people have to pay for the rest of their lives. Uh, and there's a cost there. There's not like you, you don't spend any money as my son thinks, I don't cost any money so I can live at home forever. I'm like, no, you cost, I have to feed you and electricity and flushing the toilets and all that takes up space. So for the elderly people, as we say, they're gonna retire it's very difficult change where you don't have as much disposable income because you don't, you can't generate as much disposable income. So th there are some things and, you know, reverse mortgages um, and, you know, equity on your house type of loans and things like that. Although as much as we think they might be a sham, there is money that's being lent out is what we have to remember. And that money is being used for whatever reason that person has a right to do with the equity they've built up in their home. And so whether children or whatnot, like it or not, if they're of sound mind, they can do whatever. They, your parents don't have to leave you anything, Tracy. Actually, that would be good because then I don't have to worry about the brothers, you know? There you go. There you go. So there's not a, you don't come out on the, what is that show I've been watching? 48 Hours or, you know, Unsolved Mysteries. Or I've been watching a lot of that. But yeah, I mean, I told my kids, don't be waiting on me to leave you millions because there ain't no millions. It's over. You know what I mean? When I die, the $5 checks that I get every month are over. There's no more. You know. Yeah, and my parents are in their late 60s. So if, if they live to their 90s, I mean, they're young is what you're saying. <laughs> they're well, they have a long time to go. So if I'm, I'm totally like going to like pitch this idea to them, if, if they want to go, let's say travel or do whatever they want. This is this is their golden year. So All right. Good. Anybody else want to share? Good job, Tracy. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, something interesting you learned about your program or didn't know or not interesting at all. I say, I don't know. It's, it's difficult when it's a B course. Anyone have any questions or comments regarding our other course? What do you think, Marisa? Yeah, make sure you all set up meetings with us regarding any questions you may have, whether it has to do with your evidence table or any of the documentation paperwork we discussed. So um, I would say for, for my people that are here and we're still trading Maria, but uh, Mary, Mo, JL, uh, who else is missing from me? Uh, Nancy, Nancy, she's not even moving. Is that a picture? Nancy, move, so I know it's you. Okay, there you go. <laughs> well, you guys need to make an appointment with me this week. At least just a, a status, how's it going? How's the baby, Mo, JL, you know, some, what is it, the Jergens coloring for men, something. <laughs> but you guys need to make an appointment for me this week because I want to hear from you guys because I want to make sure we're on the right path. Because the evidence table and the literature searches you've done should predict what results you're going to have. So I need to hear from you guys this week. Midnight, one in the morning, maybe not early. I do better at night than I do during the mornings. But uh, at some point, I want to hear from you guys so we can kind of sit and just go through. Maybe you feel like you want to do something else. Maybe something else came up. Maybe you just have questions on what you've done. Uh, but I do want to hear from you. So set up an appointment with me anytime when you're free. Mo, I know, uh, Mary and Mo uh, have late nights. Uh, Nancy, 
whenever you get a chance where you're back on the treadmill, uh, you know, definitely this week, though, I want to make sure that we're doing everything appropriately before we move on to a bigger assignment, which is writing your literature search. Were you all able to look at the examples that I put up for the evidence table, the literature search, how I describe my literature search? That's what we're going to do. That is exactly what we're going to do. So all these things have to flow and be logical and we have to be able to backtrack them. So that's what our literature research should show with our photos, the questions that we did for the first assignment. All those have to flow and they have to make sense to fill in all the gaps. There shouldn't be a question as to what happened here. How did you end up from here to here? We should be able to backtrack it. So I want you guys, that's what we're gonna meet about to be, make sure we're able to explain that, all right? So all the gaps. That's all we have. So remember the next meeting date, February the 4th, right? Everybody make sure, make plans to attend February the 4th at 6 p.m. That will be the next meeting date and time, okay? And your vaccine records, vaccine records. David, if you could get them to fax them to us, uh, I think you'd have to call. They don't want to release HIPAA or whatever. Or if you have a copy, you can scan them or take send it. Send it for now. If all you have is a photo of whatever old vaccinations you've got on there, send them to us. The three ones that are revolving as considered current. Remember the uh, tetanus T DAP you should be getting, not not a TD anymore. It should be a T DAP. Those are in the emergency room especially. Um, Maria T DAP since you work with babies. <clears throat> the flu and the TB. Okay, so those three are renewed periodically and now COVID. Now the COVID is not a requirement, but if you did, we'd like to document that. If you didn't or haven't or et cetera, that's okay. But those three are standard. So we need copies of those, even if they're current. If you don't have your hepatitis B, if you can't get those, David, um, you know, but we want those three that are renewed uh, at least now before we meet with Dr. Miller next week. All right. Anybody else? Shh, be quiet. Most babies asleep. Mm. It was your talking. <laughs> All right, guys. We won't keep any longer. I know you had long days. Please be safe. If anyone is ill, if anyone has some obstacles, barriers, things that are just going to pro prohibit you from either finishing assignments or keep you from progressing, please reach out to us. Please let us know before you know you've made a decision. Before anything happens, we want to make sure that you know. Uh, you guys feel loved and supported, and I think you're the greatest. And are you still recording? Good. All right. Um, <laughs> yes, we have nine of you, and we have ten of all nine of you. You is special. You is smart. You is, but honestly, reach out to us. I know. I know that I hear from Mo and Mary all the time that they're they're bringing down and putting up organizations and buildings and 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 projects for care. And I know it's very stressful. Nancy, uh, Tracy are running around. You know, trying to get all sorts of things. I'm sure JL and um, David are also very, very busy. And Maria's just there holding babies and telling the little matriz. But it's okay, Maria. Your, your time will come, all right? Um, let us know, honestly. If anything comes up, if you're stressed, if things are seem like they're overwhelming, reach out to us um, and we'll see how we can help or, or things aren't always a catastrophe. It's a very fluid program, as you can tell. Uh, we are interested in your success. So please reach out to us, all right? All right, guys. Good night, everybody. Am I staying on? Are you kicking me out? <laughs>